Okay, letter number two. I don't know how we're doing on time, but I told you we're getting through this chapter, but I don't know how long it'll be. Smyrna is our second letter. It's the shortest of all the letters. In fact, it's the only it's the only letter that does not receive some sort of correction. So Smyrna, our shortest letter, it is known as the Suffering Church. It, it, it's going to have a theme in it with the patriarchal period. Of course, you hear that first word in patriarchal, you can hear the first word, pa. It means it means the oldest male of the family. You know, of course, matriarchal ma is the oldest. You know, it would be a, a on the a mom side. The patriarchal period is the period that we talk about with uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, leading us up into the point of Moses, uh, and that's what this period is going to be talking about in just these few short verses. So, verses eight through eleven. It's a suffering church. There's a lot of martyrdom taking place in this church. There are basically, if you're in this church, man, you better just really make sure that you know Jesus as Savior, trust him with a resurrection. Uh, and, and ironically, Jimmy, uh, to add to this theme, Smyrna means uh, myrrh. And that was, a, that was, a, that was, a, that was a, a spice used to prepare, an ointment used, I should say, to prepare a body for burial. <laughs> so they're in the they're in the embalming you know city or however we want to word it for today's lingo. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful city visually. It was actually known as the Crown of Asia was one of the names for it. It was really a leader in both science and medicine, um, and so they they really were very knowledgeable people, very intellectual um, driven people, and also a very large Jewish community here. And if you can think through what that means, that means that the biggest enemies of Christianity, the Jews who did not convert, was the a large population uh, in Smyrna. So that means a lot of conflict for the Christians. Yeah. Also, just as a point of his, history, Polycarp was the bishop or the pastor of, of Smyrna. Of course, he was a disciple. Polycarp was a disciple of the apostle uh, John. And so that's very interesting. He was actually, um, it, it, when he was 86 years old, Polycarp was martyred for his faith in the city, known as the Suffering Church, Myrrh. I mean, this is just really a, a, very, um, a very sad letter sent to this. So and ironically, it's the shortest letter. So let's go ahead and read that together and, and uh, look at this letter. Verses 8 through 11. And on to the angel of the church of Smyrna write... These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. And Jimmy, if you don't mind, if we could put back up on the screen our um, our structure for our letters. If you'll notice in yellow is our preamble. What's our preamble? And I'm just going to say this for the sake of repetitiveness, because this is a lot of information. And, you know, this is in a lot of ways a classroom. So uh, hang with us in all these. And if you hear me repeat something, it's just for it's just for rote for you to get it down. So I'll just kind of, re, you know, replay some of these ideas. The preamble is just the, the conquering king's way of saying, this is who I am. Here's who he is in yellow. These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. It should be no surprise that we're going with a resurrection theme to a church that is about to face certain doom. In blue, we get to historical prologue, which is basically saying this is how we got to this point. I know thy works. You'll notice that historical prologue always kind of points backwards. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are uh, the synagogue of Satan. We'll explain all that in a moment. We get to our uh, green highlighted area, and that's our ethical stipulations. And basically, it's another way of saying this is what's expected of you. Here's what's expected. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Here's the sanctions or the consequences of the actions. Uh, be thou faithful unto death. And in our uh, turquoise, I think we're calling it, or teal color, succession arrangements, is our future plans. Here's what's going to happen. I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the uh, Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt uh, of the second death. In fact, Jimmy, I probably should say, and I will give thee a crown of life, could be all of the sanctions. Now that I'm looking at it, uh, I probably should have added that in the sanctions part. But you can you can see the general idea. I'm not trying to be too, too much of a stickler on these 
um, color coordinated things here, but I think uh, you can see we, the general idea. Is there a is there a test at the end? Do we, there is no test. <laughs> well, he says a classroom. Huh? <laughs> well, everybody gets an A, so that's the good news. You get out of it what you put in, so there's not much uh, not much of a class going on there as far as the test goes. All right, so let's go ahead and start the beginning here. We have our patriarchal period from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Look at verse number eight. He says, Unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Of course, as we're getting into this resurrection theme, Jesus is echoing what was already said in chapter one. If you look back in 17 and 18, he says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand upon me saying, fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. And so it, of course, he's going to reiterate this kind of a title to a church that's facing possibly martyrdom. He's saying, listen, if I could say it this way, he's saying the resurrection process works. Take me, for example. I've already died and I'm alive and you might have to die too, but that's okay because you can have everlasting life also. And you can use me as an example. I was one that was dead. I've already done that. And now I'm alive again. So he's the perfect person to encourage people who are living in myrrh or Smyrna because he's encouraging them to be faithful unto the end. So he's emphasizing the resurrection. And of course, um, he's asking them to be willing to die. So he's the only person really that would be um, able to say such a claim that he was dead and now he's, all, he's alive again. Now, this resurrection theme is foreshadowed all throughout the patriarchal period. Let's just kind of take a few of those. Uh, probably the first one on our list would be Abraham taking Isaac up the mountain. Remember, he says that he's going to take um, Isaac up, and he looks at somebody and says, the lad and I shall return. And he thought he was going to go and actually uh, sacrifice Isaac. You know, Isaac looks around and says, you know, hey, Dad, I, I see the wood. I, I see the fire. Where's the sacrifice? And I can just imagine a tear in Abraham's eye and says, the Lord will provide, son. What faith Isaac had. We all know, we all understand Isaac could have gotten away, right? He could have ran away, but he was the child of promise. God had already promised Isaac that he was going to be the father of many nations. To be a father, you have to have offspring. Isaac was the child of promise through Sarah. He's the, he, is the, he is the line of the new covenant. And if that's going to happen, if the Lord asks you to sacrifice your son, then of course, he's going to have to resurrect him or else he would be a liar. And Abraham knew that wasn't going to be an option. So either he's going to find a way out of this mess or the Lord's going to resurrect him. The lad and I will return. What faith? Abraham, what faith? Of course, at the last moment, as he has his knife up to slay his only son, sound familiar? The father of many nations sacrificing his only son. Of course, at that point, the illustration's over. God sees his faith and stops him. And here's where it, it sort of breaks illustration because God didn't stop killing his only son on our behalf. He went through with it. Even though Jesus said, if there's another way, if there's another way possible to let this cup or this, this uh, punishment pass from me. But of course, in the story of Abraham, it actually kind of has a, a neat twist at the end because he looks over and there's a ram caught in the thickets by, by his horns and that becomes the sacrifice in the place of Isaac. So from the perspective of Isaac, I, I taught uh, something a couple of years ago that said, um, understanding the resurrection through the eyes of Isaac. And, and really, if you get through the eyes of Isaac and you look over and you see that, that ram, that one died in your place. That one was so you didn't have to die. And Jesus was that ram caught in the thickets. Notice the perfect sacrifice of Jesus didn't have any blemishes According to prophecy, he couldn't have broken bones. And the other uh, malefactors on either side, remember, they broke their legs. When you're being crucified, you actually die from asphyxiation. Uh, to get a breath, if you can imagine how horrible it is, you have to push up on your feet to get a breath. And you push up on that, that nail hole on your feet to try and breathe. And that hurts so badly. And then you slump back down again. And really, you can't breathe with your arms up and your lungs. I'm not trying to be graphic, but your lungs begin to fill with liquid. And you die basically from suffocating and from drowning in your lungs on your own 
blood and everything that's going on inside of you. It's a horrific idea. And so remember, they broke their legs. That was a way of getting the, the, the crucifixion over with. Because then you, if you break your legs, you can't push up to breathe. And then once your legs are broken, you have no strength to breathe anymore. And they would suffocate to death from asphy- asphyxiation is really the cause. Of course, there's a lot of causes, I'm sure, but in that case. But remember, they came to Jesus, and they came to break his legs, and they stopped. They said, he's already dead. They said, well, put a spear through him just to make sure. Remember? And they put a spear through him, and the water and the blood came out. And when the Roman soldier saw the water, he's like, what? Who is this? And they knew that there's something different. But through all of that, consider none of his bones were broken because that was fulfilling the Old Testament picture. Well, the ram that was caught in his horns, it wasn't caught by the leg. Caught by his horns was a picture of Christ stepping in for us, unblemished sacrifice. So we see that. We'll, we'll just hit a couple others. And think of Joseph, Joseph's brothers, the, the, the tribes of Israel, the, the other 11 tribes, they're going to kill him. One brother steps in and says, don't, just, don't kill him. We don't want his blood on our hands. Let's just sell him. Let's just sell him into slavery. So there's one instance of him being down in a pit. Nope, I'm alive again. Then he makes his way back up and folks are thinking well of his name again. And then, of course, Potiphar's wife comes along and ruins that, falsely accuses him. He's down in the pit again. You know, and so there's a theming of, of Joseph. Of course, we get also to um, the Exodus is probably the greatest picture of that, which this would end, ending the uh, patriarchal period, ending this patriarchal period of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph— then remember, Joseph dies, um, and his bones are then taken, and we have this idea of Moses is then the leader, and then we get into the bondage, and then eventually the Passover um, coming out. So we see this idea of Israelites are in bondage, they die, and that's why it says that Moses was baptized into the Red Sea. Um, this idea of a death, they were dead and the Lord resurrected them, and then they're going through the wilderness wanderings from there. So we have this theme as the point here. Let's go ahead and look at Revelation again. So he says, I was, in verse 8, I'm the first and the last which was dead and is alive. Verse 9, he says, I know thy works, the tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. In other words, what he's saying there is, you may be wandering around and you may be hurting, but you're actually the richest people there. If we know we have everlasting life, if we know that the greatest problem to mankind we have an answer for, which is death, we are wealthy. And whatever anybody is going through that's watching this video, if you have some sort of a a medical disability or you have difficulty through a relationship, I know so many people are hurting watching this. If you know Jesus as your savior, I can absolutely based on the authority of his word, guarantee you that in time, in time, you'll be made whole. That's the promise from God. And it may not be in this life. I'm not trying to sugarcoat it. But I know this, if you have the keys of hell and death through the power of Jesus's blood, you are rich. You say, Ken, you haven't seen my bank account. You are rich rich. I heard somebody give this illustration recently. I thought it was so good. They said, if I were to give you a, a million dollars right now, let's just say 10 million. If I give you $10 million right now, would you, would you take it? And somebody said, well, yeah, I'd take it. They said, okay, but you can't wake up tomorrow. Or would you rather wake up tomorrow and not have it? Well, I'd rather not have it and wake up, right? So the point of that is saying you waking up tomorrow is more valuable than $10 million. And when you think about life in those terms, you're wealthy. Now extrapolate that out to the future of our resurrection through Jesus. How blessed are we to know that we have everlasting life? He says in verse nine, I know thy works and thy tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. I know the blasphemies of them, which say they're Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. So this is very interesting let me just ask our viewers to consider this. Who would, uh, what Gentile would say they're a, a, a Jew? That didn't exist in the first century. These were actually people who claimed to be descendants of Abraham and said, because of that, we're in covenant with God. Paul says it this way in Romans. He says, not everyone that is 
in Israel is of Israel. We have like the subset Paul's talking about. What is that subset? Well, if people want to know more about that, they can watch the video that you and I did actually on the, the biblical definition of Israel. And right here, what we have in this first century setting is we have people that are from the seed of Abraham that are saying, because of that, we have an in with God. We're right with him because we're of the children of Abraham. And what he's saying here is they say they're Jews, but they're not Jews. Their family lineage is that they can trace their blood back to Abraham, but they're not Jews. What, what does the Lord Jesus mean by that? What he means by that is the definition of Jew has never changed since Exodus 19, which was, if you obey my voice, if you keep my commandments, it's always been conditional. And if not, you're cut off. And it's the same thing today, Jimmy, when we're watching the news. You know, when I hear people talk about Israel today in the news, and they say, well, we all know these, these are God's chosen people, so we have to, you know, protect them. It just makes my skin crawl because that's not the case. God only has one people group, and it's those that are in covenant with him. Now, I care about the people of Israel. Absolutely. I care about the people in, in Palestine. I care about the people in China and the Philippines. And guess what? Everybody in Israel, everybody in Palestine, whatever the case may be, all of them have the same pathway to salvation that you and I do, and all of it funnels through Jesus Christ. Full stop, there's nothing different. They don't have any, um, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu does not have an in with God because he's the prime minister of Israel. He has to humble himself and come to the cross through the blood of Christ. And these are the people here that say, I'm not coming to the cross through Christ. I can go backwards to Abraham. And, and right here, Jesus is saying, these are the ones that say they're Jews and they're not. So what are they, Lord? Well, they're, they're, they're of the synagogue of Satan. People have said, what does it mean to be uh, of the synagogue of Satan? Well, uh, we can understand that. Let, let, me, let me go back for uh, just, just a second here and point out a couple verses. In Genesis chapter 21, this is actually prophesied, so I want to just take a second to acknowledge that. Genesis chapter 21 and verses 9 through 13. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore, she said unto Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, Hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called, and also of the son of the bondwoman, I will make a nation because he is thy seed. So we see here that there's a fight going on, and Sarah looks over, and Ishmael is mocking Abraham and Isaac, and Sarah's like, wait a second here. This is a son that you had with our handmaid, Hagar. We should never have done that because we ended up having Isaac. And she's like, why don't you kick... Kick him out. I'd be like, it was your idea. <laughs> it was your idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's some blame to go around for sure. <laughs> and um, they should never have done that. I'll just say they should never have done that. And so Sarah's saying, hey, kick him out. Why are we dealing with this? And um, the Lord says, yeah, you should probably listen to Sarah. I'll, I'll deal with them because they have your blood in them. But at the same time, this is the one, this is the promised one, and I'm going to make you a father of many nations. So we see this kind of theming over and over again. Look, if you would, in the book of John, chapter 8. I'll just highlight this. I believe we've talked about this before, so I won't spend too much time. But if folks want to um, pause this and read more of this um, interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees, I'll just highlight a little bit of it here. But it's beginning in verse 37, really, you could start this thing and you know, really the beginning of the, of the chapter, but, you know, you could start it in um, 27 or so if you want to get the full um, idea. But look in verse 37 for the sake of this. He says, I know you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which you've seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. 
But Jesus saith unto them, if ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. Now let's go ahead and look at these two verses in 37. I, Jesus says, I know that you're Abraham's seed. Verse 39, if you were Abraham's children. So Jesus is acknowledging, acknowledging what we're saying here. Paul says, not everybody who is, is in Israel is of Israel. Jesus says, you're of Abraham's seed. That means biology. You're of Abraham's seed, but you're not Abraham's children. That's a relationship. You might be able to go on Ancestry.com and show that he, you're related to him, but that doesn't mean you're in covenant with me. So Jesus begins really making this distinction. So if they are not of, if they're not children of Abraham, even though they're his seed, you know, I would like to know what Jesus thinks they're the children of. Look at verse 44. He says, you are of your father, the devil. The lust of your father, you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh of a lie, he speaketh of his own for he's a liar and the father of it. Jesus says they have a father. It's not Abraham. It's the devil. And so this doesn't really sound like the, um, you know, the people of God, the chosen people of God. No, you have to be in covenant with God to be his people group. And so here we see that in verse number nine, they say they're Jews, but they're not, but they're the synagogue of Satan. Okay, so what does this mean, the synagogues of Satan? Well, we observe later, um, and this is interesting, we observe later that it's Satan who's called the accuser of the brethren. And then we see that it's the Jews, so put this together. If Satan is the accuser of the brethren and wants to throw them in prison, accuser, you know, a, a, a court term, he's the accuser of the brethren wanting them to be in prison or killed, But we see it's the apostate Jews who are the ones that are carrying that out. So you can put two and two together, and we're going to see this theme all the way throughout our study. But the actual desire of Satan is being carried out by the Jews that oppose Christianity. They are the agents of Satan. And we're going to see that throughout our study over and over again. Uh, Let me go to one other place before we move on. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I would like to show people kind of a, a brief outline of the entire book of Revelation, or at least a, maybe we could say like you do for a movie, this is a, a, a trailer, a teaser for the book of Revelation. 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 14 through 16 is kind of like a teaser coming up for what we're going to talk about throughout the whole book of Revelation. So Paul says, For ye brethren became followers of the churches of God which are in Judea are in Christ Jesus. Notice in Christ. That's what we talk about in the salvation shelter, in Christ Jesus positionally. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. So, Paul, what's going to happen because of this? So, we have these Jews that are persecuting the prophets. They're killing the Lord Jesus. They're, they're, they're going against and having war, basically killing whoever they can that are followers of Christ. What's going to happen, Paul, as he's writing this letter in the first century to the church of Thessalonica? Verse 16, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always. For the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. So the wrath of God in the first century in the letter to Thessalonica is come upon the Jews who have rejected Jesus as Savior, and they keep claiming they're right with God because of their bloodline. And in the, the book of Smyrna is making it known because remember, they have a large Jewish population that no, just because they say they're Jews, they are not. They're liars. They're not in covenant with me. But in fact, they are of the synagogue of Satan. And it says here um, in verse number 10, he says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. So a couple of different ideas in this verse. Number one, as you notice here, that Jesus is saying it's the devil that's casting them into the prison. But in reality, we know that it's actually the apostate Jews who are casting them into prison. 
So here he's using the term Satan and apostate Jews interchangeably. These are Jews who have locked arm in arm with the Roman Empire. They're using political clout with the Roman Empire to destroy all of these Christians. But here, uh, Jesus just simply says, it's the devil that's casting you into prison. And he says this very interesting phrase. He says that you may be tried and ye shall have tribulation 10 days. Well, I think because we're in the period right now of the patriarchal period, 10 in the Bible in many, many ways is used as a a, a figure of speech or something that will really represent. Consider these things. Um, Let me go through a couple of these. The 10 virgins in Matthew 25, the 10 talents of Matthew 25, the 10 lepers of Luke 17. Uh, Later, we see John describe the Roman Empire in tens. There's 10 horns in Revelation 13. There's 10 crowns in Revelation 13, 10 kings in Revelation 17. So all these tens usually have a reference to something small that represents something, and usually that something is much bigger. And I think also, if you think about it, this is in verse number 10, which would bring our patriarchal period to a close. We've gone through this, this, this period would include... Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and would bring us all the way up into would end with the with the ten plagues. So if you're if you're following the historical narrative of sections two and three, and you know that this church is going to bring us all the way up into the ten plagues, it would make sense then that the uh, the ten here may represent just the same idea of the plagues. Like, hey, this is going to be horrific, but you will get through it. In other words. Historically speaking, it's not going to last forever. It's a finite period of time that is concentrated, horrible, and it will come to completion. He says this, he says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. This is a very interesting phrase because we also see in the book of James. James is the only other one that speaks of this crown of life. The reason that's interesting is because it sounds like James read the book of Revelation. Now, we know here that it's not because Jesus read the book of James. <laughs> Jesus doesn't need to get his information from James. But here it sounds like James is actually quoting verbatim Revelation, which again, uh, I wouldn't you know, stake my whole claim on this. But again, that is uh, another proof of the dating that we're giving with Revelation, that James had access to this. Therefore, he was probably being able to read this and, and use it as a resource when he was writing his own letter. So just another little nugget that James is quoting from this that would, would lend credence to uh, the earlier date. I want to talk about also just for a moment this idea uh, in verse number 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit saith unto the church is, he that overcometh shall not be hurt uh, of the second death. That's in connection with the crown of life. Now, this thinking of this crown of life, this this, uh, promise of the eternal city, we see this in Hebrews chapter 11. Let's go ahead and jump over to Hebrews 11. Um, I would love, Jimmy, if possible, one day when we're done with this, to be able to go through the book of Hebrews, because it is... is, um, it's such a great book. There's, there's a lot of stuff I want to go through together, but, but um, Hebrews would be a fun one. But look at the Hebrews 11 and verses 8 through 10. Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, so it, as in a strange country, dwelling in, a, in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, their heirs with him of the same promise, For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Look down in verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, and having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declared plainly that they seek a country, and truly If they had been mindful of that country from whence they came came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned, but now they desire a better country. That is, a heavenly, where God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he had prepared for them a city. Here we see a heavenly city. Abraham knew that all of his ministry was heading towards a heavenly city whose founder and maker was not man, but all the way made of God, and he never quite got to see it. What is that city, folks? It's the new Jerusalem. It's the bride adorned for her husband. It's you and I. We are like great stones made up, as as we're going to see in one of these letters, 
God offers to become a pillar in the temp- in his temple, and we are the new Jerusalem. It was literally the kingdom that Christ is building. It's the nation of Christ. And Abraham believed in it. He embraced it, it says. He was living for it, and he never got to see it. But he'll be resurrected one day. He, for sure, will see this crown of life that's being offered. And you can see the, the theming of Smyrna, myrrh. It's the suffering church, an emphasis on resurrection. I was dead, now I'm alive. I, is he, I, I'm the one that is the first and the last. And all of these encouraging things was dead and is now alive because they are suffering. The shortest of all the letters, but they're dealing with a tremendous Jewish population. And um, let's go ahead and go to letter number three. If you like this video, hit that like and subscribe button. And check out the full episode by clicking the link below.